So today's subject is nomenclature, and this is a absolutely no fun subject to cover as an organic chemist because it's something that fundamentally you just need to memorize. And to the extent that it's not just about memorization, then there's actually an algorithm that you can follow in order to do nomenclature. And big picture, once you've done enough nomenclature, then you know when you can kind of skip it and get past it, but you first need to start by memorizing the names of the various objects, the various functional groups and suffixes and prefixes and so on and so forth, so that you can apply the algorithm. And once you've done all that, once you've understood how this all works together, then you can largely forget about it. Because as a professional organic chemist, I tend not to rely on my nomenclature skills anymore. But it was necessary to have that locked away in my head so that if someone says a ketone, I immediately think this out of all possible structures out there. So you need to know nomenclature, you need to know it so deeply that if I say one of these magic suffixes to you, you immediately think of the thing that I'm thinking of. That's the reason why we need to do nomenclature. Now there's a whole bunch of rules and it's easy to test and so on. So we're also gonna focus on some problems that essentially amount to can you generate the right names and so on. But the main reason for that is largely to lock away the key information. When I describe something in words, you need to be thinking mentally of the same image that I am thinking of, and that's really the key here. And this will be a lesson that applies across organic chemistry the entire class, all semester along. You have to just simply memorize some stuff so that then you can apply it. So okay, what would be the first things I'd want you to memorize? Well, you can count to 10 in organic chemistry, and this is the list of the key 10 prefixes. If I'm going to tell you about a molecule that has one carbon, I'm going to use the term meth to describe it. Methane specifically is just CH4 and it looks like that. But if I'm going to be referring to two carbons, that's F. So F would be the prefix I use when I'm describing a molecule that contains two carbons. So this would be ethane, this would be ethene, this would be ethine, and so on. With three carbons you have prop. With four carbons you have bute. With five carbons you have pent. With six, hex. With seven, hept, with eight, oct, with nine, non, and with ten, dec would be the prefix. So again, simply memorize this. You know how to count to ten. In English, you know how to count to ten, probably in a couple of other languages. The way to count to ten in organic is meth, eth, prop, bute, pent, hex, hept, oct, non, dec. But if you have that stored away, then you've got a leg up onto a nomenclature. The other thing you simply need to memorize is key functional groups. So for the purposes of the nomenclature part, what you're gonna to need to know early on, ane is a suffix that ref refers to the molecule being completely saturated, no double bonds or anything like that. Ene would refer to having a double bond, and you could have more than one double bond, in which case it would be a diene, or you could have three double bonds, in which case it would be a triene, and there's a whole set of prefixes associated with that. Ein refers to a triple bond. All means that you have an alcohol, and an alcohol specifically is R singly bound to an OH. Own refers to a ketone, and that means that you have a carbon double bond to an oxygen with specifically two carbons attached to that same carbon. That's a functional group that will show up a fair bit. Amine refers to the same general idea as an alcohol, except it has a nitrogen instead, which means that it has two hydrogens, or at least the capacity for two hydrogens to be installed there, whether it has other methyl groups or not other carbon atoms at that point, it would still be an amine. And then eight is a suffix that refers to an ester. So ethyl acetate would be an ester. Butyl butyrate would be a ester as well. So there are more functional groups that you're simply going to need to know than the ones that I've illustrated so far, but these are definitely the ones that you should start with. These are all also found on the inside cover of your book where there's a just table of functional groups and you absolutely just simply need to memorize the names of the functional groups and again, if I say a functional group, you should be able to come up with a structure. If you see a structure, you should be able to think of the functional group name. The general category of all functional groups that are contained within this dotted green line is carbonyls. And so carbonyls in general, if I have not specified what's out here, is just a carbon double bond to an oxygen. So all of these fall under the umbrella of a carbonyl, they all contain a carbonyl, I should say, regardless of the details. However, if specifically you have a hydrogen bound to the carbonyl, then that becomes an aldehyde. You call that an aldehyde. A ketone specifically needs to have two carbons bound to the carbon of the carbonyl. A carboxylic acid has a hydroxyl, same general idea as an alcohol, hydroxyl, 
bound to the carbon of the carbonyl, and amide instead has a nitrogen bound to the carbon of the carbonyl. And I don't need to specify what's out here. This could be H's or carbons or anything else. And then we have an ester, which is specifically an O bound to another carbon bound to the carbonyl. So that right there, ester, is part of the carbonyl. Now, there's a very related looking thing that doesn't sound the same, but ester and ether are somewhat related to each other. And ether has an oxygen bound to a two carbons, one on either side, and ester also has an oxygen with a carbon on either side, but it also has to have a carbonyl. So the difference between ester and ether is the presence of the carbonyl. Ether does not have a carbonyl. I've already mentioned these guys. Alcohol, hydroxy, would be the way I'd refer to the uh, this particular group. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because students have a tendency to conflate a alcohol with a carboxylic acid, and they behave extremely differently to each other, again, based on the carbonyl. So the carbonyl matters a lot. It's one of the functional groups you definitely want to pay attention, pay attention to throughout organic one, and also organic two, for that matter. And then the last thing I'll point out is if you see the, suff uh, the prefix cyclo, what that's referring to always is some kind of ring structure. This sequence of compounds will allow me to illustrate one more thing that you just need to memorize because there's basically old ways of referring to things that are nevertheless less clunky than the standard IUPAC nomenclature way of doing things. So I need to illustrate them for you so that you can then follow along. So let's uh, draw the structure associated with N-propanol. So propanol would have to be an alcohol, that's the all part, and the prop part means it's a three carbon alcohol. So one, two, three carbons, and then an OH. So that would be N-propanol. And you can read the N to mean at the end of the chain or a primary, or in this case, this would be the one position. So N-propanol, N-propanol is roughly the equivalent of one propanol. That would be synonymous. So the one position of the propane, propane is where you bind the alcohol. Isopropanol, on the other hand, has to be a different molecule. And if you have N-propanol, then that means you have three carbons and you bound the alcohol to the one position. Well, you could bind it either here or here. Either one would become the one position because of the nomenclature priority rules. So isopropanol has to be different, which means you draw your propane chain. And if you, you can't bind it at either end because that would be one propanol, the same as above. So isopropanol then has to be bound at the two position in this case. Now this isn't a general rule yet, we'll expand that in just a minute. All right, N-chlorobutane, butane meaning four. So this is going to have to be a four carbon chain, there you go. And again, N-chloro would be, you could attach the chloride at either end. So if I put it here, that would be one chlorobutane, or I could put it here, again, one chlorobutane. And so again, you should read the N as referring to bind to the first position. Okay, but if we have sec chlorobutane, again, it has to be different, but now we're gonna bind it to a secondary carbon. So the primary carbons were at the end. The secondary carbon's going to be right here in the middle. So that would be secondary chlorobutane, sec chlorobutane, and it's because you're really binding this at the two position. If you see sec, you should assume that means at the two position. Okay, then we have tert butyl chloride, which is just fundamentally different. And the answer is going to be as follows. You have to have a tertiary butyl group, and this carbon right here with three other carbons bound to it, this is a tertiary butyl group. So a tert butyl group simply refers to having four carbons in this arrangement. A carbon that's bound to the thing that you're interested in and three other methyl groups bound to it. That's a tert butyl group. So can I generalize this iso group in a similar way? And the answer is yes, not knowing what the group is that I'm bound to, ISO is simply going to refer to this kind of arrangement with a Y kind of at the end. And this, as drawn, is always going to be referred to as an isopropyl group, regardless of what the X is that it's bound to. All right, so in terms of things that you need to memorize, you need to memorize all the prefixes, you need to memorize all the functional groups, and then, as well, you need to keep in mind that ISO is always going to refer to this kind of branched Y group at the end, and isopropyl in particular means a three carbon chain where you're binding through the middle. And then terbutyl is simply going to be a four carbon unit where the thing you're interested in is bound to the carbon that has three other methyls bound to it. If you have these pieces together, then you can go work on IUPAC naming.